actually read a couple of scriptures and then just want to share something I feel the Lord has given me tonight. And you hath he quickened. Everybody say, that's me. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. If this verse sounds familiar, we read it a few weeks ago. I don't know how long ago, but <coughs> somewhat recently. You walked according to the course of this world in time past. According to, that means following after. According to the prince of the power of the air. Now, I don't know that we all want to readily admit that. If I say that's me, and in time past, thankfully that doesn't have to be today, but in time past, you actually followed after the direction of the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Everybody say now. now. The spirit that now worketh. I, ha I didn't do an exhaustive study on this, but I think it's worth looking into whenever the scripture says the word now, it doesn't just mean the day that the author penned those words, but it, ne it means now, as in this second, this moment, today. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word is forever settled it's not going to change, and it wasn't just for back then. And it's not just for some time in the future. It's for now. Now, including when the scripture says, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, that's not talking about the Holy Spirit. That's talking about the spirit of the prince of the power of the air. The evil one. The wicked one. That spirit is at work now. It was at work when Paul wrote this, church, this book to the church in Ephesus, and it's at work now. Paul is just simply reminding everyone. That's not to, to spook anybody, but it's to remind you the place that you came from, there's still people there. The authority that you were once under and operating under, there's still people living that way. The spirit that now worketh. And that's how it's going to be. The now is going to be until God changes that. At some point in time, in the future, God's going to say now that spirit's not allowed to work anymore. That spirit won't have the reign and the authority that it has had up until this point. The world. The, everybody say the world. This verse says, you walked according to the course of this world. The course is not, it, it, that doesn't sound as dramatic and as drastic as Oh, you're following after the spirit of evil. You're, you're under the authority of it, that. But the scripture is plainly outlining for us that this world has a course, a direction, a, a system, a, a process. You're following the process that this world has, is what the scripture was saying, or you did in time past, others Still do. Many years ago, I say many, it's been at least five. I don't remember when. But I went to uh, a call to war seminar in Maryland. And I, did, I went there not knowing what to expect, just expecting, anticipating that the Lord was going to speak to me, uh, open to direction, open to whatever the Lord would have for me in, in that moment. 
And on the first night of, of that conference, um, the Lord gave me a word. And when I say a word, I mean a single word. And uh, he took me to a place of prayer over that word. And it was difficult to leave that place of prayer. And I don't mean like I couldn't. I mean like I didn't want to. I didn't want to leave whatever the Lord was doing in that moment for me. I knew this was a word that he was dealing with me about. The word was future. Everybody say future. future. Now he was talking to me in the context of my future and the future of my family, my household. And there's not much, even, you know, a, a hard man that's just tough and, you know, non-emotional and, and all those things. If you want to soften him up, talk to him about his family. Talk to him about his kids, his wife, his grandkids, if he's got them. Talk to him about that, and you would likely see a side of him that you don't see really in almost any other context of conversation because that's the thing that the man is responsible for. If you want to insult a man, talk bad about his kids. Talk bad about his wife. Talk bad about his home. That's an insult to a man. You can talk about his truck, uh, Whatever, I'll, I'll wash it one of these days. I'll fix that tail light one of these days. You know, that, that's not going to impact him as, as much as those things that hit closest to home. So when the Lord was dealing with me in this moment about my future and the future of my home and my family, it was like the Lord was just putting a, a white hot light on the thing that is most precious to me. And thankfully, he doesn't do that often because probably emotionally and spiritually, I wouldn't be able to bear that if he took me to that place often in prayer or in devotion or whatever. But that word future is uh, a key of what I'm feeling the Lord would deal with us all about tonight. Again, where it says in Ephesians 2 and 2 that you walked according this way, you lived according this way, and the fact that it says th those are still the conditions of this world. Simply put, what that means is if a person doesn't know God or pursue God, they will inherently be funneled down the course of this world. They will be taken by the processes and systems of this world. They will not know about repentance. They will not know about grace. They will not know all these things that thankfully you and I get to see and hear and experience on a regular basis. The world goes the opposite direction. Everybody say creation. creation. Creation sounds like a past thing, something that happened a long time ago in the past, something that happened way, way back at the start. Because when we hear creation, we typically think Genesis chapter 1. We typically think in the very beginning of time. But as I already said, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he didn't just do one thing one time and decide, well, I'm not going to be a creator anymore. I, I, I've exercised my creative uh, tendencies, and now I'll just go on to being Lord of something else. No, if it's a part of his nature and character, it is eternally a part of his nature and character. Creation, then, is something that he does, not something that he did. And it's something that you and I get to be a part of, not just something we will observe or benefit from or whatever. It's something we get to participate with. 
I'd like you to think of creation in future terms for a minute instead of past terms. What's being created? What's being created through your life? What's being created in your home? What's the future in your situation? Not just Genesis, but today, now. I'd like you to look. Let's, let's consider this for just a moment. What was the world like? What was the earth like before God began creating? Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. If you'll look there quickly, you'll see what the earth was like before God began creating. Now stick with me. I'm not here to talk about geology tonight or history. But we look here and we'll see some very interesting points. Obviously, we know Genesis 1-1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And at the very start, it says, The earth was without form and, what's the word? Void. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. What does that mean? The earth without form and void. It means empty, waste, or it also means a place of chaos and confusion. Now, not talking about the past, because I, I asked you to think about creation in future terms. This is what God had to work with when he began creating. Nothingness, emptiness, that was wasteful, a place of no order. Now, let's just be kind to ourselves for a moment and say that doesn't describe us or our homes or our families. I think it ought not, and I'm not telling you that it does. I'm just saying if the creative power of God is not at work, this is what you can expect. Emptiness. Confusion. Lack of any order. <laughs> now, if we want to be real for just a moment, when's the last time there was chaos in your house? When's the last time there was confusion in your house? When's the last time? I, I, I'm being a little bit in jest, but... Think about it. Just be real with yourself for a moment. And don't blame this on somebody else. Well, the kids brought the chaos. Oh, no. Who created those kids? Who created the environment that those kids are living in? Don't blame it. Oh, my wife turned me into a chaotic person. Nope. Nope. Well, I would have order if my husband would just, no, we don't, we don't blame this on anybody else. If I know that the creator puts things in order, puts things together and for purpose and for function, then I ought to be able to at least look at my life and say, if the kids don't got it and the wife don't got it, at least let's start here and say, are things in order here? Is there function here? Is there purpose here? If not, I need to get with the creator. I need to get alone with him and say, build here, Lord. Work here. Establish things here in my life so we can build going forward. I want to talk to you a little bit about this godly creativity. Godly creativity. If we don't nurture a sense of godly creativity, we will experience emptiness, chaos, even a sense of worthlessness. That emptiness simply comes from the fact that we're not engaged in creating. I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself, but think about your time for a moment. If there's one thing that you ought to be able to look to and say, 
I don't have a lot of time, or maybe I've got a whole lot of time. Am I being productive with what time that I have? Or am I content to let that time be spent in nothingness, in emptiness, in wastefulness? I pray that's not the case. Emptiness comes from the fact that we're not engaged in the creative process with God. God gives us things. He gives us family, marriage, relationships, friendships. He gives us these things and gives us the ability to be creative with them. And I'm not talking about like spontaneous creative. I'm talking about intentional. What am I building in this relationship? What am I building in my home? What am I building in my marriage or with my kids? I want you to pause and ask yourself, especially those of you with marriages and children, ask yourself, what's being created in my family? Because again, not to just be redundant, but if you're not creating, if you're not putting things in order according to God's order, then the default becomes the course of this world. If you're not creating, something else or someone else is creating. It it doesn't just happen, okay? You can look at a person you respect, maybe a, 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 a husband or a wife, or you can look at a parent, you can look at a family that you respect and think, man, they... However they got it is right. Well, however that is, if you've got that picture in your mind, I promise you that didn't just happen by accident. Just like the world didn't happen by accident. There wasn't a big bang, and then all of a sudden we've got this stuff. The same is not the case in a godly life, a godly home. It wasn't just a big bang, and then all of a sudden you got the perfect Pentecostal family. That does not happen. It's not by accident. I promise you. Again, we're talking about future. Creative, godly creativity towards the future. Two things you've got to have in order to have this are purpose and vision. Purpose means you're not doing it aimlessly. You're not just going about life waiting to see what will happen but you are purposefully working. I'm going to spend this day on purpose, not just let it go to waste. That's purpose. And the other vision, vision is interesting because we know scripturally it says without vision, people perish. But you don't, let me help you. You don't just get to create the vision yourself. You've got to work with God about the vision, about the future. Because it might be my vision that my youngest son becomes an NFL linebacker. And then I can rack up all the debt I want. Oh, this sounds far-fetched, but I promise you, it's rooted in reality. I can rack up all the debt that I want. In my life, I can bring all the chaos that I want and disorder into our home thinking, well, at least one day when my vision comes true and my son signs that first NFL contract, then we can start correcting all of this mess. And then he's going to get a second contract and we can go forward from there. And man, pretty soon we're going to be rolling in the dough. The only problem with that is if that's not God's vision. Come on. Come on, Adam. I say the only problem, that's a pretty big problem. <laughs> if it's not God's vision, and purpose, you, you, you derive the purpose from the vision. But if I say my vision for my youngest son is that he becomes a godly man, a godly husband if the Lord tarries, a godly father, a good employee, a soul winner, somebody that's involved in the kingdom of God. Now, I I promise you, God's not going to look at those things and say, nah, I think I'd just rather him go play football. 
I'm not knocking football, but I am promoting godly vision. Yes, sir. Yes. The godly vision of the future is what we're talking about. So if I know I've got that vision, then I can work with purpose right. and say, you know what? You can, go, you can go play, catch, or tackle your siblings for a little while. But then we're going to rein it back in and talk about purpose. We're going to work on cultivating the godly creation. Yes. What that which is right according to your purpose. Again, it doesn't just happen by accident. You ought to have dreams. Parents, you ought to have dreams of what you see your children being. What you see them becoming. Spouses, you ought to have a dream of what you think your wife or husband should be. Now, don't be harsh and say, well, you're just not measuring up. But it's, uh, it's just as harsh to say, whatever you are, Whoever you're going to be, that's just who you are. It's, it's equally as harsh, right, to take away any responsibility. Yeah. You, you can have the dream of what you think this ought to be. Otherwise, you simply chase the status quo. Or you live a life of emptiness. You live a life where days are spent pursuing nothing but the course of this world. Everybody say building. There are things we build. Building and creating are basically the same thing. Now, I realize a lot of this lesson that I'm, that I'm talking about tonight has to do with the context of family, parenting, and marriage. And you might think, well, why don't you just teach the Bible, Elder? I don't know who that was. Hopefully it was nobody. But I am teaching you Ephesians 2, 2. The course of this world. <coughs> the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that already works, now works in the children of disobedience. If the Bible can talk about children, I can talk about children. If the Bible can talk about disobedience, we can talk about disobedience. Building a family, building a home, it doesn't just happen, it takes faith, purpose, vision, it takes discipline, concentration. To be a part of a family is to be a part of creation, creational living, godly creation. Maybe, I, I, I love the diversity that we have in this congregation because if you all had been married for 19 years and have five children, it would be a lot harder to talk to you because <laughs> you would know exactly what I went through today and last week and last week, the week before that. But God has put all of these members in the body, those that have been married 40 years, those that have not ever been married, those that are about to be married, and those that never even think about being married. We're all in the room together. And we all read the same scripture. We all have the same Lord. We all work towards the same goal of being like God. Now, let, uh, I can't go there. No, let's not do that. That'll get me in trouble. We're talking about creation. Godly creativity. I want you to think about our lives as they are without God. What does the course of this world promote? Well, I don't know how long ago it was, a few years ago, five years ago, a new career entered the world called 
content creator. That wasn't an option when I was growing up. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a content creator. What does that mean? But today, you ask a kid, what's a content creator? They know exactly what that is. Now, I'm not just doing a play on words here. The creation, the creator, if it's not done in a godly manner, things, content, is still being created all the time. I mean, I don't have the stats, but if you just, if you just got on YouTube and clicked refresh, 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 there would be a new video every second that you clicked. Why? Because there are so many content creators in the world. It, we ought to be able to just look at our children, at our families, at our homes, and say, what content is being created here? Or are we just living off of other people's content? Am I just subscribed to so many other content creators that I have let that replace the godly creativity, the purpose of godly creativity in my life, in my home, in my family? Now, this is not a call for a fast, but this is a, this is a remarkable statement I'm about to make. It would be very valuable for you to say, I'm not going to watch any new content for X amount of time. Any new content. I'm not knocking new content, okay? There's things out there you should see and know and be aware of, I'm sure. But you also shouldn't have the mindset that says, I got to have new. I need new. What's new? What have I missed? What have I not seen yet? If, if you can't go a week without new content, we got a problem. Future, godly creativity in the future. I want to give you just a quick quote. I don't read a lot of books, so when I do read them, I got to let you know. <laughs> a life spent in a dead-end, joyless job with evenings spent in front of the TV or other screen and weekends spent just passing the time will feel like hell on earth because it is hell on earth. If you allow the course of this world to, allow, to cause you to just drift through life, that's hell on earth. That is the prince of the power of the air working in the air, working in this world. And we wonder why people have so many problems. Well, oh, they're just, they're hooked on this. They're addicted to that. They can't go without this. Or they always talk like that. Or their mind is full of this. Their actions are full of that. I wonder how much of the prince of the power of the air is allowed into their lives on a regular basis. What I'm talking to you about is the alternative to that. It will be, your life will be spent one way or the other. The alternative is let the creator work in your life and then participate, actively participate with him in your life, in your home. All my kids aren't in here, but a few of them are. I'll tell you, sometimes I just get the urge at home on an evening, and I say, everybody come in the living room. I don't have a plan. I told somebody one time, fatherhood is improvision. 
And I love it when they come in there to the room saying, I know what you're going to tell us to do. No, you don't, because I don't even know what we're going to do. What am I doing? I'm allowing opportunities for godly creativity. One of our, <laughs> oh, I can't say that, but I have to say it. One of our favorite games is, who's somebody in the church? And then we just go from there. In a good way. You know, sometimes, like, who's somebody you would want to spend the night with if you had to spend the night at their house? Or who's somebody that, if, if you got to choose the babysitter, who would you choose? Right? And, and then you get to see, oh, I didn't even know you knew that person's name. Good job. Or, yeah, we won't go there. But I, I, it's a fun game to play. What are, what are we doing? We're, I, I'm not allowing other content creators to control that time. I'm not allowing other influences to rule times five or six or seven. There's seven people in the house. Uh, instead, I'm saying, let's be purposeful with this time. Let's have a vision for ourselves as a family. Let's have goals. And then let's see, are we working towards the purpose of those things? Or do we let the cares of life distract us from those purposes? Because sure enough, as soon as you talk about saving a little bit of money, they're going to have the best idea that they've never had before about how to spend money. And now we've got to look back and say, okay, well, I love the creativity, but let's talk about the purpose. Now weigh your creativity against the purpose. That's a different story for a different day. The call is to not waste your life. If we need scripture, the prodigal son wasted his life on riotous living. The unfaithful steward wasted the opportunity that was placed in his hand. And instead of turning it into something, he simply said, oh, well, thanks for letting me hold on to this for a little while. Here you go. You can have it back. That's not what the Lord expected. I expected you to create something with what I gave you. The call is to not waste your life. Let me give you a few examples. I can just already feel it. My wife is saying, why didn't you run these past me? <laughs> I'm going to give you a few examples, things we don't necessarily think are being productive, but they're certainly not wasteful. And you engage in these activities, I promise you're on your way to being purposeful. This, this applies to men, women, and children where applicable. Examples of things we were meant to create. Preparing meals. Oh, that's just so-and-so's job. That's just what they do. Oh, no, it's not. I promise you. Nobody wants to spend the rest of their time preparing every meal for themselves. I'm not saying that you don't like it occasionally, but there is, I heard Bishop say it the other day, nothing tastes better than something that was made for you. Actually, what he said was something that was made by somebody else. But you like to not always have to do the work. Therefore, when you put in the time, the energy, the work to preparing those things, you are engaging in something creative. You're engaging in something productive, purposeful. This one, I just got to read it. Decorating a home. I'm not going to give you decoration advice. I don't do it. I won't do it. But that's not time wasted. Now, you can go to the extreme, and then all of a sudden, oh, okay, well, you probably should have stopped here, and then everything from there on might have been a little bit extra. But it's not ungodly to say, 
I want a, a place that looks livable. I want a place that looks comfortable. I want a place that looks like a, a family lives here without killing each other. I added that last part. Achieving, remember we talked about dreams, okay? And if the dream is from God, if the vision is from God, achieving a vocational dream can be purposeful, can be a part of godly creativity. A vocational dream, that means like, I hope someday I become A, and then you work towards that. That's not, that's not sinful. That's not slothful. That's not necessarily distracted. That's working towards a vision. And when God agrees with that vision, I, all I can say is this. No one should be idle with their time, meaning not doing anything with it at all. Okay? Okay? That becomes a very dangerous place to live. It becomes a very dangerous mindset to say, well, I'm just not going to pursue that thing. I'm not going to try and achieve that goal. I'd rather, I don't want to say this, but I'd rather just sit at home. You know what? You can be productive from home. There's a lot of jobs you can do at home. Amen, Brother Ethan? There's a lot of things that you can do. So I'm not saying, well, he just stays home all the time, so he's not productive. No, you can have productivity and a dream and be creative. The opposite, again, is the course of this world. Pursuing nothing or emptiness. Amen. Matthew 25 and 26. I referenced this. I'm almost done. Matthew 25 and 26. We talked about the unfaithful servant or steward. I'm not going to take the time to go through this. Bishop ministered from this context a few weeks ago. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. You know enough about me to know that I expect you to be productive. That's essentially what the Lord is saying. You knew that I was a hard man. That's another way that it's put. And instead of acting accordingly, you acted in opposition. Dare I say you acted in defiance. Oh, Lord, I, I, you, hold, you set the bar so high that rather than try to reach it, I just decided to stay down here. The problem with that is we have been disillusioned. We, we, we've been deluded. We've been given a delusion. We believe a lie that tells us because I know God won't accept me, or because I know I won't be good enough for him, I'm not even going to try to be good. Who does that sound like? That's not the Lord. But there are voices that would love to have you think that way, operate that way. Influences. Influences that come along when you're just trying to live right, be faithful, and they say, well, has God rewarded you yet? First of all, who are you? Why are you talking to me at all? Secondly, I don't serve God for reward. Not in this life. I better finish. Wicked and slothful servant. That's the, what the Lord called him. One thing that we can all build. One thing, you might not be a husband, a wife, father, mother. You might not be any of these things. One thing we can all build with God's help is relationships. Godly relationships. Okay, I'm not just saying go find strangers and go where they take you. Of course not. 
but you can build relationships. Look around this room, you could build a stronger relationship with pretty much anybody in this room that you selected. And then outside of this room, those that God brings into your life, oh, I'm not going to build. Oh, that's work. Oh, I don't feel like going out of my way. Well, let's just examine what the wicked and slothful servant said. But you can build a relationship. You can work. You can work. My last passage, Romans 4 and 17. Why don't you stand with me? This is a passage. We get to see a little bit more of, of God's nature here. Romans 4 and 17. It's speaking of Abraham. It says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead. This is who God is and what he does. Your God. Everybody say, my God. God. He quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. This is a principle of godly creativity. Calling things that are not as though they were. And speaking to things that are dead and calling them back to life. Would you close your eyes with me? I want this part of God operating in me. I want this part of his character and his nature operating in me, not just one time, not just tonight, not just when I I come together with the rest of the church. I want this part of his nature and character operating in me every day, all the time. Come on, I believe the Lord would give you some things to pray right now, give you some things to speak right now over yourself, over your home your family, the relationships that God's allowed you to have. Why don't we take a moment here and just speak some things to life. Speak some things that are not as though they were. I declare your will, Father. I declare your purpose, Lord Jesus. I declare it in my life, Lord God. I declare it in my home, Lord Jesus. I declare it in my family, Lord God. All that you have for us, God. All of your benefits, Lord Jesus. Everything that you would extend and offer to us and more, God. I'm, I want to be a part, Lord Jesus, of your creative power, of your creative plan. I speak it tonight in Jesus' name. Come on, speak it in faith right now. Speak it in faith, believing in the name of Jesus. I declare it tonight, Father. God, I loose your power to be at work. I loose your spirit to operate, Lord Jesus. It's a good time to pray it over family members right now. It's a good time right now to speak it over family members, over our sons and daughters, over our spouses, our parents, our cousins. Lord, in your name, I speak your will. God, I agree with you, your will and your purpose. In the name of Jesus, let there be a godly creativity, godly power at work in each one of us, I pray. I, I so much enjoyed, I so much enjoyed getting to pray with the children at VBS. 
I'll tell you just one quick reason why, one little glimpse. When we're, when we're talking about adults, a lot of times, you've got to look for the outward manifestation of somebody that maybe wants to be prayed for or is ready to be prayed for or desirous. With adults, you got to, oh, I don't, I, you know, they're clearly going through some stuff right now, and they don't look like they want to be prayed for at all. You just don't see that with kids, okay? Now, th- they may not be praying, crying, eyes closed, and hands raised, and stammering lips, but that doesn't mean they're thinking about, oh, I just lost my job, or, oh, the course of this world is just so evil. Or my neighbor backed over my, you know, whatever. (laughs) Why is that? Because all that there is there is what has been put in them for a short period of time. And, you know, the Lord said, except you be converted and become as little children. That's, That's a godly instruction to us. So I examine and say, well, what does the child have that I don't have? They're they're void of a lot of this world's ways. They haven't been indoctrinated by X, Y, Z, whatever it is. I mean, around this room, there's this many different pasts and this many different life experiences. And what happens is those things hold us back from being open, from being honest, from being available to the Lord. And with a child, it's not there. We could learn from that. Amen. Let's pray one more time. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your instruction to us, Lord God. I pray let it become a part of who we are, Lord Jesus. Let it become a part of our praying, O God. Let it become a part of our faith in you, Lord Jesus, to believe you for those things, whether we see them or not. God, to believe you and trust you for those things because you are good, because you are the Father, you are the Creator, you are the Source, God. I thank you for it. Let this be a part, Lord Jesus, of who I am. Your nature in me, I pray, God. Your nature in me, I pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen.